Um, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us today. Um, we're delighted to have you join us as we discuss um, the all too important issue of gender in conflicts today. Uh, we will be focusing on the ongoing conflict in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and other Sahelian countries. My name is Dr. Chiedo Wanko, and I am um, faculty with the SAIS um, African Studies program at SAIS, and I also direct the SAIS Men Lead. Uh, globally, one in three women have experienced gender-based violence, physical, sexual violence in their lifetime. That rate, as we know, is much higher in conflict um, afflicted areas across the world. In addition to posing a significant security challenge, um, this act dehumanizes women and girls and some men. Sexualized violence and other forms of gender-based violence has become normalized during conflict and often used as a weapon of war to terrorize and destroy the fabric of communities. As this year's International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which is celebrated every November 25th approaches, the question remains, is the world doing enough to address the scourge of sexualized violence in conflict, as well as um, gender-based violence across the world? Why has it not become a priority of world leaders to eliminate this inhumane act? Why have we not gone beyond rhetorics. If the world contained and is continuing to contain nuclear conflict, eliminate the plague, the polio, and so on, why has the narratives of intractability and impossibility successfully stymied real and concerted global actions towards eliminating this evil? With me to discuss this issue today is a panel of distinguished experts. In no particular order, is Hasina Safi, the former acting Minister of Women's Affairs for Afghanistan. Also with us today is Yodit Lema. Yodit is a Senior Program Manager for Africa at the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. We also have Krish Umara. Krish is President and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services. And last but not least is Onela Modaran, Onella is head of the Sahel program at the Institute for Security Studies. Thank you for joining us this morning, ladies. Um, and so, because we you know, don't have much time and we have a lot to um, get through today, uh, we just uh, jump into it. And so um, for the entire panel, why is gender implicated in conflicts to the extent that it is, right? So why does it shape conflict in such fundamental ways? What implication does gender inclusiveness, that is when we move beyond the masculine feminine binaries, um, what implication does this have for gender conflict, uh, for the gender conflict relationship? Um, perhaps we start with you, um, Onela. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on this conversation today. The question you're asking is extremely broad and extremely important, I think. Um, one of the trends we see uh, here in the Sahel, of course, is uh, the militarization of the conflict and the response to it. So, I think that there is definitely something to the fact that um, we have a tradition, I would say, um, almost as a humanity, we have a, uh, a habit of relying on stereotypes to read the world around us. Um, when it comes to conflict, these stereotypes have very concrete uh, consequences on who um, who is on the active and who is on the passive end of, of, of violence and as a consequence also who is um, uh, around the decision-making table when it comes to uh, negotiating peace. Here in the Sahel, as you know, there is uh, a very complex crisis that, that has been going on for nearly 10 years now. 
um, and in which women's participation remains extremely limited. Uh, in the Malian kids, for instance, we have less than 3% women actually involved. This is something around 36 out of over 1,000 people who are involved in the various uh, forms and structures of this process. At the same time, the data we have from UN Women, for instance, suggests that last year, 97%, 97%, of the violence, of the gender-based violence that was occurring at top of this country, was specifically targeting women and girls. So this, I think, is something that shows very clearly the discrepancy that we have. Um, of course, this also questions our own approaches to the conflict. Um, there, I mean, I'm sure we would get to, to this one later on in, in the conversation, but um, the way in which pieces uh, negotiated um, is often to rewarding or approaches that suggest rewarding uh, those who have been making the war in the first place, and this tends to, to be men. So these, I think, would be my opening remarks. I would just like to end uh, by mentioning that, you know, in the way we conceive women's um, participation, implication, or connection with violence and war, it's important to not fall into the same traps of stereotypes that, uh, that keep women from having access, uh, well, political access into the, uh, uh, the way forward. This means that, yes, of course, women and, and girls form a large part of uh, victims of, of conflict, but they also form an important portion of conflict actors, and this is something that research tends to underestimate and, and tends to uh, underdocument, as well as they form a large part of um, uh, potential access to, to finding tasks out of the violence. So these, I think, are aspects that, that require much more attention from us. And I would stop here for now. Thank you. Um, Krish, do you want to weigh in on that? Sure, I mean, I, I completely agree with, with what Ornella has, has said, um, because I do think, uh, you know, we have seen um, the violence, uh, you know, not just in war and torn countries, uh, we see it in, in refugee camps, um, you know, we see it in the communities um, that are resettled here in the U.S. Um, candidly, the data is not as uh, strong and, and, and stress tested as I think many of us would like to see. Um, you know, our hope is that there is, is more research um, that is done, particularly in, in terms of the refugee camps, of, of what violence, um, you know, women um, and girls are, are subjected to. Um, you know, even uh, right now, you know, the, the subject of Afghanistan is obviously, um, you know, a central focus. And uh, just last week, um, there were uh, U.S. senators, basically the women in the U.S. Senate, who... Uh, wrote a letter, um, a bipartisan letter, uh, kind of highlighting the violence that women and girls face in Afghanistan. And I just think that that's a clear example of where, you know, some of the trends are disconcerting. Um, you know, when you see the Taliban returning to power, um, you know, the, the lack of accountability, um, what we are seeing, I think, is, is what, um, you know, Ornella was highlighting of, of just um, ongoing violence, um, you know, there have been some, some improvements, and I think it's really to, to the credit of, of the panelists um, that I'm, you know, lucky enough to speak alongside of today, um, but I do think we still have a ways um, to go. Thank you, and, and so to, to continue um, on that line of, of thought, is and giving the pervasiveness, right, and, and the normalization uh, of sexualized violence and other forms of gender-based violence across the world, um, particularly during conflict, is it, is it an inevitable um, issue, right? Is sexualized violence inevitable in conflict? Um, Hasena, do you uh, want to start us off on that? You are muted. Okay. Uh, I would like to thank uh, SICE Women Lead and the Dean's Office for the opportunity uh, uh, of this very uh, relevant and timely event. 
uh, and I cannot agree more than what uh, our former colleagues uh, discussed about uh, the um, gender and conflict uh, in the uh, countries, wanton countries. Uh, I think as a woman and as someone who has worked uh, for the women's rights and uh, for women movement, um, not only in Afghanistan, but have experienced uh, networking and coordination with the women around the world. Uh, I would not agree more that uh, violence exists uh, all over the world. Uh, and something which I indicate here uh, specifically is that only the face uh, in the shape is different. In some places it's domestic violence, in some places it is sexual violence, in uh, some place it is physical, in some place it is mental violence, in some places it is the payment issue uh, of uh, men and women. So there is always uh, different um, faces of violence. Specifically in Afghanistan, I think uh, in the last two decades, uh, Afghan women uh, have struggled, which I'm sure as activists you would agree, uh, of how they traveled starting from uh, awareness uh, to capacity building to advocacy to uh, fighting for that uh, about uh, even indicating the word violence was very sensitive and difficult in uh, the areas where people would talk about it. So to clear uh, Katyn as an initial and start of my message, I think in Afghanistan uh, we had been uh, quite good with the policies and strategies and structures but something which uh, we had the plan uh, for the coming five to 10 years was the implementation uh, because there were no female prosecutors and judges, but in the last 20 years we had, there was a special uh, family uh, prosecution or guidance center for women where we would deal uh, the cases of violence. There was a special department in the uh, attorney general's office where we were following the cases of violence, different kinds of violence uh, for women. So uh, uh, to be very clear, I think basically not only in Afghanistan, uh, in the countries of the region and around the world, uh, one thing which we really need to emphasize more is on the implementation, on the implementation of the laws, mechanisms, to really see and monitor what are the hooks of support which help uh, women come out or to be healed out of violence. Thank you. Um, Yodit, the, the UN OHCHR and Ethiopian um, HRC reports recommended reparations for victims and survivors um, of gender-based and sexualized violence um, during conflict survivors. How will the states and international organizations um, even begin to systematically pursue issues of reparation? Like um, how, how, what framework makes this possible? How is this possible? Or is this just part of the continuing um, rhetoric around this issue? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure and a very important question. Um, I think it's very difficult to, to raise this question of reparations for victims of, of SGBV during conflict and particularly in the case of Ethiopia. And while the re report has um, shown serious allegations of, of acts of sexual violence perpetrated against women and girls by all sides to the conflict, the Tigrayan conflict particularly, um, how you would address um, these perpetrators or how they will be brought to justice uh, is sort of remains to be seen because the infrastructures to do so remain so weak. Uh, there's a breakdown of traditional and legal accountability mechanisms to address violence against women in peacetime, let alone in wartime. Uh, and I think that this has unfortunately created a culture of impunity, um, which has increased the exposure and the normalization of, of, of SGBV in Ethiopia. 
Um, and so I think it would be an uphill battle, uh, particularly when you don't have the necessary policies in place, when we haven't addressed the uh, broader issues of behavioral change, when we haven't yet systematically addressed the sort of normative frameworks that are entrenched uh, in patriarchal belief systems that pit uh, women uh, as unequal to men. I mean, SGBV in Ethiopia um, is not just something that is experienced in, in wartime. And I think that's uh, uh, the, the same everywhere. Uh, and it's for this reason, I think, uh, that it becomes so much more difficult to address it in conflict situations. Um, ultimately, we, men and women, society at large, uh, is socialized to devalue women and girls. Um, and so SGBV uh, in, in conflict um, should not be viewed uh, in isolation to the SGBV that women and girls uh, face in, in, peace, in peace times. And this is the reality uh, that we're facing in Ethiopia. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so uh, Onela, we, most times when we talk about um, gender-based violence, um, particularly in, in, in war times. Uh, there's been this tendency um, outside of emergent um, pushbacks, right? This tendency uh, to frame uh, or to essentialize women uh, or to essentialize actors, right, um, around conflict. How do we, what is the implication of this essentialization, right? How does it shape policies and, um, and programs to one, address uh, perpetrators, that addresses perpetrators, and two, uh, towards the DRR, DRR um, programs? So, um... I'm not completely sure I understand what you mean by essentialization, but if, if that is, for instance... If I may, so, you know, typically women are considered um, victims, right? Okay. Okay. And men are considered perpetrators. And then oh. it then has implications for policy mm -hmm. and um, the way the world addresses um, the issues both in both in post-conflict uh, and also in ongoing conflicts. All right, so thanks for uh, clarifying. Exactly, so the problem you're pointing to, I think, is the one we were mentioning earlier, our tendency to look at conflict and conflict actors and agencies, the various agencies that are at play in a conflict through a very stereotypical lens. So um, as Yodis was, was just mentioning, we're socialized to think of women as, um, well, as weak and passive and victims, and to think of men as aggressive and uh, potential perpetrators and so on. This kind of stereotypical views, I think, uh, cause enormous problems when it, when it comes to addressing actual violence. First of all, it keeps us from uh, looking at the real uh, actorships, at the real agencies. Um, we have ongoing research here in the Sahel looking at the involvement of women in violent extremist groups, for instance, which has uncovered over the past year the variety of roles that women play within those groups. Some of those roles are, uh, are uh, public and combative, but some are also, um, uh, you know, as part of the support chain, as part of um, uh, um, uh, information systems, and so on. So not necessarily combative, but still extremely important for uh, non-state on, on actors to survive and, and to operate. That's one. The other thing I think is, you know, these stereotypes drive policies and they drive uh, programs which as a result, are just not on point, are missing the mark in so many ways. Um, one, one example of that, I think, is when we have um, uh, so-called gender programming or, or in the peace building area, generally speaking, that insists on looking at women only as victims or only as change actors. And here, here in, 
in the Sahel and more broadly in Africa, we have this thing about, you know, uh, political motherhood. So uh, women are positive agents for change because their mothers and because they love their families and so on. Well, what about men? Uh, don't father love their families? Um, how much harm do we do when we advance this kind of uh, narrative um, in the sense that we essentially just perpetuate uh, the idea that women are essentialized in a specific way, which doesn't allow us to actually grasp the variety of roles that they take. This goes the same way around uh, for, for men being uh, stuck in a specific kind of uh, typification. Thank you. Um, and so if you're joining us, um, we would like to hear from you. Uh, please use the Q&A button uh, down um, on the screen to send in questions for the panel uh, panelists. Uh, you can address your question to individual panelists or to the um, entire group. Um, and so, um, Krish, uh, we know that, um, you know, this, this problem has uh, great implications for um, movements, displacements, right? Both displacements as well as just um, refugee flows. Do, do, um, what is the outlook for uh, international aid um, for refugee communities? And um, in your experience, would you say that the problem of sexualized and gender-based violence is a lot higher um, amongst the refugee populations. Um, you know, you know, candidly, as, as I said before, I, I don't um, feel kind of the full certainty in the data that we have to say that it is necessarily elevated. Um, you know, I do think, unfortunately, there's a range of reasons for why women may not be as comfortable, um, uh, you know, reporting, um, you know, sharing, sharing their story, stories. Obviously, as I think a number of panelists have, have indicated, um, there is clear data in terms of, um, as you did put it, uh, the pervasiveness of, of the violence. Um, I, I just don't know if I could say with certainty that we do see it in, in significantly increased numbers in refugees as opposed to the, the general population. Certainly we see that this is a strong reason for why um, women will flee. Um, and so I do think that there is a reason for why in the refugee population, it may be that a, uh, you know, a powerful reason for their migration internally and then internationally um, is because of, of gender-based and um, you know, uh, sexual violence. Um, you know, I, I don't, do also think that part of what we have seen is uh, populations that have come to another host nation or to the United States where, um, I wouldn't call it untreated, but they haven't been given um, as much access to uh, trauma-informed care um, as we want to make sure that they have access to. Um, I think some of the concerns that we have, especially here in the United States, is just making sure that women have the knowledge and the opportunity to access and navigate what can feel sometimes like complicated systems. Um, you know, everything from healthcare, um, sometimes issues in terms of interpretation. Um, having an interpreter may have a chilling effect in terms of their willingness to talk about these issues. Um, and so we know that women may face um, continued or increased uh, gender-based violence um, and that that can result in safety, uh, mental health, and medical concerns. And so that's where we do try to identify um, how significant a concern this is in the refugee populations that we work with, because it is obviously an important part of how we aim to begin the healing process here. Thank you. Um, Hasina, so given the history um, of Afghanistan and um, the West, right? Um, do you, would you say that the threat of sanction um, does act as an effective deterrent uh, in, in the prevention of gender-based and sexual violence during conflicts, or does it simply, um, does it exacerbate the problem?
you are muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think if uh, we go uh, back to the root cause of how uh, does the majority or how does a high graph of uh, violence uh, establish or maybe uh, increase is uh, the brought up. Definitely uh, when you are born in war and when you are born in peace, it has its effect on, its, on your personality. The personalities could be very clearly observed and seen for those who have been brought up in war and who have been uh, brought up in peace. The way they sit, the way they talk, the way they handle things with patients, uh, it really is a, a, a situation which needs to be digged in and understood more. Uh, the second thing in relation to your question about sanctions, uh, I think uh, it has its uh, impact and it has its result. But uh, before uh, doing the sanctions, there should be a clear study of the context because uh, geography uh, matters, uh, locations matters, uh, places matter, cultures matter. Uh, it's not only in Afghanistan. For example, within Afghanistan, uh, within Asia, it differs. So uh, sanctions have uh, its uh, positive impact based on a real and practical study of the context where we want to uh, put sanctions. And then following that, I think a very clear and defined monitoring mechanism very frequently based on a result should be followed up. Thank you. Um, Yodit, do you want to weigh in on that? Does um, the threat of sanction or actual sanction um, have chilling effects or exacerbating effects for sexualized and other forms of gender-based violence in conflict? Thank you. Um, I think just to reiterate um, Hassana's point, sanctions only work insofar as they can be enforced so long as as far as there is some sort of monitoring mechanism that um, can ensure that the sanctions are, are, are being implemented. Otherwise, they have no real impact on the ground. Um, and also uh, how the sort of local legal structures uh, are able to work in coordination with the more global, uh, be it UN or EU or wherever the sanctions are coming from, the ability for the two systems to work together um, to ensure accountability around those sanctions also really matters. So alone, I think they make very little impact in the way in which implement them, the way in which different entities, both at sort of global, national, regional, local levels, are working together to ensure that um, these sanctions are, are respected. I think that's the most important thing. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Krish, given the enormity of the problem with uh, refugee flows, um, what policies, right? What, what are some of the best models or the best practices around policymaking um, to support refugees once they arrive to a new country, given these challenges? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, and I, I think there's, there's a few things that we've been focused on um, at LIRS. So we believe that, you know, ensuring gender equality requires strong policies. Um, so there are sort of the policy solutions and then there's, there's the programmatic solutions. Um, so LIRS, you know, actively addresses the risks um, uh, and, and tries to institute solutions in a few different ways. So we have formal policies in place that state our expectations in terms of programming. Um, so these are codified with our affiliate pot partners. Uh, we, we monitor and evaluate resettlement activities um, from a gender equity lens because we do think it's critical uh, to um, address gender-based violence, but also make sure that there is equitable access um, for women um, and girls. So for example, we asked for settled women if they received uh, pocket money just for themselves, if they were provided appropriate interpretation. Um, sometimes when husbands speak English, uh, wives are left out of the conversation. 
um, which means that sometimes they can be silenced um, in, ter in terms of sharing this information. Um, you know, sometimes we make sure that when we do interviews, uh, we conduct these interviews um, by separating the spouses um, so that they can have, you know, the, the, the privacy, the confidentiality to share um, this information. But I think on a, on a broader level, um, one of the most important things that, uh, you know, we want to see is that this is a core part of how we undertake diplomacy. You know, so here in the U.S., um, you know, uh, we wrote an op-ed um, uh, advocating for the U.S. to basically make um, recognition, for example, of the Taliban contingent on ensuring that all girls um, are able to complete their secondary educations, um, that we make sure the gender-based violence, you know, to the extent that we see this undertaken um, and government sanctioned. You know, some of the cases that we're seeing is obviously uh, a government's military itself, um, you know, related to kind of one of your initial questions, that they're undertaking this and they're using it as a tool of suppression or a tool of war. And so I think on the international stage, what we need to see is that sanctions are based heavily on, on, on seeing an end to this violence. Um, but we also need to see that women are at the table. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, we were obviously, we, we are quite concerned when we see a government that is disproportionately represented um, by, by men only. Um, and so I think that at, at the international level, we need to see uh, certain requirements that are instituted by the UN, um, by, by leaders like the US to ensure that until um, and only when certain conditions are met that um, you know, diplomatic recognition is allowed. Uh, when it comes to foreign assistance, obviously we do have concerns because we wanna make sure that the assistance gets to the most vulnerable who need it. Um, but, but obviously we have to be thoughtful in terms of not just allowing funding to go to corrupt governments and governments that may be either sanctioning or turning a blind eye to the violations that I think we've all been talking about. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, Hasina, so given the way things stand at the moment, um, what types of assistance, um, right, or, you know, frameworks of policy engagement uh, do you hope to see implement, implemented uh, to help women and girls uh, that are still in Afghanistan, right? Um, how can the international community, um, if at all, lend um, any kind of support? What is the outlook for the lives of women and girls um, that are left, uh, that continuing to live in Afghanistan, which is their, their, their motherland? Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, it's the question which I was really waiting for. Uh, taking uh, this platform as an opportunity, uh, I would like to again ask a thank you for this question. Uh, I would uh, categorize it into three, uh, basically three uh, main messages. The first message is uh, the issue of protection and evacuation of women. I think this is every human's right. Uh, to choose uh, where to live and how to live uh, based on uh, all the humanity and reality and human rights declarations and all the uh, values of life. So the first thing uh, which I would suggest is um, uh, those women who are at risk and they need uh, protection, uh, the international community uh, should, uh, as uh, based on the values, they should uh, put in more efforts uh, to help them out, spe specifically uh, those women who have been uh, vocal and outspoken in the last 20 years. Uh, the second uh, thing would be the mid-term uh, suggestion or uh, plan, which I would suggest, and definitely that is the humanitarian aid where education and health come first. Uh, for women. Uh, I would uh, urge for more um, influence or uh, negotiation uh, or dialogue about the primary, secondary, higher education of women. And also those women who have done, for example, 
a girl who was in grade five or six in 2002 and 2003. Today, she's a doctor. Today, she's a professor. She might want to give back to the country. So these are the areas which would take us to the third uh, suggestion, which I'm giving is the really to see a definition of women in the caretaker government. Like what is their definition uh, for women uh, in participation? Because as uh, human beings and as all, uh, all of us see that our home is our smaller community in society. Uh, no home or no community or society looks complete if they, it's only women or if it's only men. So as a part of defining a very solicited and a very, very clearly vision society, both men and women together. So that is really the vision or the paper or the, the strategy of present uh, uh, caretaker government to define uh, for women. How can, for example, a woman come and tell an issue to a man if they are not allowed to uh, talk uh, to a man? And the other thing is, as a result of the last 40 years of war, there are many families, there are many widows, there are many families, there are many girls who have lost their fathers and brothers. So how would they handle out of, for example, 37, 38 million population, 50, more than 50% of them are women. So how, who would handle? What would be the mechanism in the address? So that would be where the international community and specifically presently those partners who are planning to put more efforts for the humanitarian aid should be very clearly indicated for women to really get. And again, I will emphasize more on transparency, accountability, and monitoring. The more we monitor, the more we can be transparent and accountable to what's happening. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And so, um, Ornella, given your role um, at uh, Institute for Security Studies, um, might you want to, uh, you know, briefly weigh in on the impact of sanctions um, on this issue, and then also briefly just um, uh, add to this discussion of the models, right? Uh, the best practices um, for helping or sending aid to women and girls uh, in, in this, in your particular case, um, across the Sahel. Thank you. So um, about sanctions, and I, I, I typically control with, with what my predecessors have all said. Um, I do think that we should um, look at the broader issue of accountability, right? Um, when we're looking at sanctions against uh, conflict-related conflict sexual and gender-based violence, but what we're talking about really is accountability in two main dimensions. First of all, it's an AHL question, it's an uh, international humanitarian law question. So um, the issue there is how, how effective are the policies and uh, are the policy legal and even the use of force based tools that we have in delivering accountability in war context in general, whether or not it has anything to do with uh, gender based violence. How good are we really at delivering accountability for war crimes and uh, war atrocities? I think the answer is generally speaking not very good. So what there is the rationale for assuming or hoping that we would somehow we be better because the specific, the specific time, type of, in, of infraction would be uh, gender-based violence. And then, and then the second dimension which adds to this, I think, is the general impunity that grabs gender inequality in many parts of the world where, you know, very offered uh, patriarchal systems for this. Um, what are then the social hooks one has to, to press for gender-based violence accountability, whether or not something related uh, in contexts where, you know, domestic violence is normalized, uh, where powerful uh, social forces continuously block the adoption of legislation uh, against uh, violence against women 
um, uh, as being um, uh, anti-local, uh, where initial family laws systematically disenfranchise women, etc. So I do think that um, one of the, um, uh, I would say, almost conceptual traps we should avoid falling into is to to look at sanctions for SGBV or conflict-related SGBV specifically without looking at the broader issue of accountability uh, for war affected in general, whether or not related to gender, and then without looking at impunity and accountability for uh, for uh, violence against women and LGBT in general, with whether or not um, specifically connected with, with conflict. If we don't do these two things uh, separately well, there really isn't any reason why we would do the combination of them uh, the intersection of them well. So um, uh, that, 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 that's what I wanted to, uh, to add on. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Yodit, do you want to follow up on the, the question uh, that Hastina uh, just uh, addressed, right? Um, what types of assistance and policies, right, in your role uh, in the humanitarian dialogue, um, do, do you hope to see implemented um, across, uh, in Ethiopia, um, uh, to, to help women and girls who are caught in this um, viciousness? Sure, thank you. Um, I think the fundamental issue um, that should be informing any policy that's going to address gender inequality, be it in conflict or in non-conflict uh, zones, uh, is how we move into more gender transformative relationships. How do we um, increase women's participation in um, society, be it public or economic life, uh, be it political or civic engagement, um, and how do we ensure that inclusion is taking place? And I think policies that are directed to improving inclusion across the board will begin to foster um, women's participation uh, in processes and um, in activities um, in, in policy making uh, that will uh, redefine women's roles by equalizing the playing field. I think we, you know, we, we've been talking about these issues for decades. Nothing that we have said today is particularly new. I think the, the missing link is um, how do we move from what's on paper into more action, into more transformation. Uh, and I think this is a bigger question about uh, inclusion um, of, of, of women, but also uh, of marginalized communities, uh, of underrepresented communities, uh, and that cuts across um, race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, and in Africa, you know, ethnopolitics often also divides this question of, of inclusion. And uh, so I think it's, it's about moving um, into a, a world that uh, is ensuring that relationships uh, across the board are leading to transformative change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so to, just to continue on, on that uh, track, um, are there existing frameworks you know, and mechanisms uh, in addition, other existing frameworks and mechanisms uh, in addition to gender inclusiveness or trans gender um, institutions uh, that can promote peacekeeping um, in the region. Um, what new policies or what might these institutions uh, look like? Um, feel free. Um, Krish, do you want to weigh in on that? Or maybe uh, Yodit, anybody can weigh in on that. Um, Onela, let's start with you, perhaps. Um, sure. So 
Again, I'm, I'm not completely sure I understood the question correctly. Right. Um, so, um, if, let me just uh, maybe clarify that. So um, we are talking about models that work for peacekeeping, right, across uh, the Sahel. Um, what do you, are there uh, best practices in peacekeeping uh, for the region that will actually work, right? Given that we've been uh, on this issue for quite a while now, and uh, the conflict only seems to be um, expanding and exacerbating, and women are increasingly getting drawn into this conflict, and uh, the normalization of um, sexualized uh, violence and other forms of, uh, you know, uh, barbarism against women and girls, and, and also, you know, some, some men, feminized or whatever, seems to be on the increase. What are the best models for achieving real lasting peace across the region? Okay, so, um, I mean, if we're talking about peacekeeping specifically, then I, I think that could be a particular time for QN intervention, and, and if you're in the Sahel, that could be specifically the work of the MINUSMA, so that would take us for the conversation on, you know, how to improve women's meaningful inclusion and participation in peacekeeping efforts. Um, great work is being done. Uh, by the LC initiatives uh, supported by Canada and so on um, in trying to figure out what exactly the benefits of having more women on the forces, uh, on visiting forces uh, across the globe are and um, municipal experience here is, I think, quite interesting in, in, in this sense. Now, that said, I think your question is actually broader than peacekeeping and it has to do with um, the way in which we look at gender in waging peace. Um, if, if, if that is the case, then I think, well, again, as we were saying at the beginning of this uh, hour, women are half or even more than half of the population. Um, they have agency, we have agency, um, and we definitely need to be part of the conversation. So um, uh, initiatives such as uh, Policy, strong policy takes towards uh, increasing women's presence and presence in meaningful positions uh, at high level of political uh, decision making and, and negotiations are absolutely crucial. That said, um, these high level or rather top oriented um, uh, inclusion approaches also need to be looking at the way in which you know they foster uh, inputs. Uh, from from the law, from community level. So this means that we need to make sure that whichever women end up on X, Y, Z commission or panel isn't just talking on her individual own behalf or on uh, behalf of uh, of a uh, an interest group that actively overlooks uh, the 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 needs of women. This is something I think we still have a hard time doing. Uh, there has been a lot of, you know, kind of quotas and uh, similar approaches tried in, in the region. Most of the time they remain uh, on paper and rarely translate into actual um, increase in numbers. But if, even, if, even when they do, uh, that doesn't necessarily translate in actual increase in agency and influence for women. So we really need to be looking at the political economy of these uh, institutions and whether or not um, uh, women's participation engineered to, uh, to, to policy measures is leading to tokenism or is leading to a actual agency. All right, um, thank you. And so uh, perhaps to, to uh, round off, uh, uh, let's go back to the question I outlined uh, in framing this discussion um, you know, at, at the start which is whether the world is doing enough to address um, the scourge of sexualized violence in conflict. Um, you know, we've sent people to the moon and um, we are containing nuclear violence. Why is, you know, why, why are global leaders not prioritizing this epidemic of sexualized violence um, against women and girls, as well as against um, some men, as we know? And uh, in what specific ways, right, can 
these, what are some of the specific actions that can be taken to um, bring this into the limelight and to um, kind of compel uh, global leaders to uh, pay real um, action, real attention to this? Um, Krish, do, do you want to? Um, well, yeah. We have just. Uh, eight, we have just. Yeah. Eight. Yeah. yeah, and I'll, I'll just very quickly say, um, you know, I think there's a few things. So one is is continuing to have um, panels like this. So really grateful um, for your moderation. Uh, appreciate SICE um, hosting this discussion because I do think that in small ways, this is the way to continue to make this issue front and center. Um, I think second, you know, candidly, uh, when we label it a crisis, to some extent, it seems to uh, generate at least more tension, if not action. But that's what we're facing, right? This is a crisis. When you describe one in three women who've uh, experienced this, um, you know, I, I do think this needs to continue to be front and center. Um, and I think part of the solution uh, in the medium term is having more women policymakers who are making the decisions. Because when women are the victims um, rather than the perpetrators, and yet we're not the political leaders um, in, in, in many settings, um, who are determining how to prevent this, how to make sure that there is justice. Um, I do think you continue to see the perpetuation. And then I think just more broadly, um, obviously we're talking about uh, the, the, the strongest version of this in terms of gender-based violence, but even the Me Too movement, um, it's an important starting point in terms of making these issues more comfortable to talk about. But we have to recognize that this is, it's an epidemic. Right, it, we see it across the board in a range of actions, and I do think that is why you know using the term crisis. Um, I, I don't feel like that's overly dramatic. Thank you, um, Hassan. Let's get your thoughts on this. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, um, the world has not done enough because if it would have been done enough, we would not be in this circumstances. The, all the women around the world. Uh, I think uh, I, I agree with Krish that we need to do more of such events, but uh, specifically I would indicate um, some points. The first one is clear description of sexual violence or violence. How does it affect or impact uh, the social, uh, economical uh, lives of people around them? Uh, the second thing is messaging, definitely. Perhaps uh, we, the women activists and the women who are fighting for this cause, they should uh, analyze or maybe assess the way they are messaging. Uh, how can it improve? How can we more improve the messaging or uh, the messages which we want to uh, take up to the policy level uh, leaders or to, to the global policy makers? And the other one is uh, uh, connecting uh, the relevancy of uh, uh, the effect of violence or sexual violence uh, to the bigger global society, how it really uh, handicaps the society if there is uh, sexual violence or violence within uh, the community. And nothing can be uh, done ahead unless there are uh, really powerful uh, and visionary uh, women uh, leaders uh, within the, um, the circle of decision making in order to clearly define and describe the situation. Thank you. Um, Yodit, so as we approach the November 25th, um, what, you know, if you can just weigh in, what, what, what should global leaders be doing more, right? What, 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 should, what should they be doing more? What should we all be doing more uh, to possibly uh, get around this problem? Mm, sure. Um, I mean, I think that if we don't have very deliberate and decisive interventions to disrupt male dominance in decision making, women will continue to face an uphill battle in terms of reaching a critical mass that can shape and influence uh, political agendas and ultimately, uh, you know, gender equality is a political agenda. So there are a number of things that, that you know, the, the global community and global leaders can do to, to ensure that this agenda remains sort of front and center of uh, addressing um, sexual and gender 
violence. And of course, one is ensuring that the right funding mechanisms are in place, be it between multilateral institutions or regional institutions, uh, or even at national uh, and sort of local levels, ensuring that the, the funding mechanisms are there to ensure when there's greater participation in decision making. Um, and specifically in terms of peace work and mediation, there's a number of things that, um, you know, practitioners can do to, to ensure that women are, are engaged from, from the very beginning uh, of a peace process uh, to ensure that political analysis and sort of laying the foundation to understand contexts and the landscape of conflict is gendered at the outset, um, but also ensuring that mediation teams are mandated to include uh, women, that there is a quota for that, uh, as well as negotiating teams uh, I also think um, the same goes for, for peacekeeping. I think it's, it's high time that um, we, we are deliberate about uh, ensuring that, that women are, are in uh, positions where, where they can influence, uh, but also having independent spaces for, for women um, that, that uh, allow, uh, I think um, it was mentioned earlier by one of our colleagues on the panel, uh, that providing spaces for women uh, to navigate their issues uh, just among themselves is, is also really important, uh, creating those, those safe spaces where we can address uh, some of these issues without that, that male domination, I think uh, also helps uh, women to, to better frame uh, policies that are specific to um, addressing gender inequality. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I'll stop there. Let me stop there, thanks. Yeah, so um, thank you very much. Uh, real interesting um, uh, points. Um, Ornella, do you want to uh, quickly weigh in before we um, close out? I think most of the, the points have been brilliantly raised by my young colleague, yeah. Um, all right, so um, Hasina, if I may just uh, go back to one of the things um, that you, you Given the the issue, um, the present issue uh, in Afghanistan, just really briefly, um, what is the outlook for women's, you know, inclusion in in the caretaker committees? Uh, maybe uh, thirty seconds, so we can round up. Uh, I think presently there is, there are no women, and they also abolished women ministry. Uh, that is why when you said what do women from international community want, I think the reason that I indicated on the dialogue is that there should be an address for women so that women issues and programs are discussed within the caretaker government process. Thank you. Thank you so very much. So um, thank you so very much, uh, Yodit. Thank you, Krish. Um, thank you, Onella, and thank you, Hasina, for joining us today in this uh, really crucial discussion as we continue to um, engage with uh, the world around um, issues of sexualized violence in conflicts, as well as um, gender-based violence in general um, across societies. Um, thank you so very much, and um, we look forward to having you again with us. Um, thank you for those of you joining us across the world. Um, we're really glad you're here. And we encourage you to continue to um, engage with us as Sites Men Lead and, and also at uh, the Dean Talk Series. Uh, thank you so very much and um, thank you. Have a nice day.